winning a few battles in the war on legal immigration, cutting the number of people who've come into the United States, but so far they haven't won the war. A lot of what they've done is held in place with duct tape and string, and one court decision that goes against them could end it because they need Congress to actually make anything permanent. If there was one thing that I think the nation needs to be paying more attention to right now, it's the Remain in Mexico policy, the so-called Migrant Protection Protocols. I've been down to the border. I've been to Ciudad Juarez. I've talked to people in this program. It is a stain on the rule of law, and it has politicized the immigration court system in a way that has never been done before. And it is actively leading to thousands of children and families being put into enormous amounts of danger on a day-to-day -day basis. And yet it has never broken through to the same extent as when U.S. agents were tearing kids from their parents' arms because it's out of sight and out of mind and on the other side of the border. I often like to say that the Trump administration realized that Americans would rise up in anger when it saw our own government officials doing horrific things to people at the border. So what they did is they exported that. They outsourced the violence and the crime and the danger to the cartels in Mexico and let the cartels do the deterrence work that our agents were no longer able to do. Sorry. Question. What is the status of the separated children from a year and a half ago? The answer is, the big picture with separated children is that family separations are still going on at the border. What we've seen is that, since Judge Dana Sabra issued his order to halt family separations more than a year ago, I believe over a thousand children have still been separated for various reasons. In January 2020, Sabra permitted the government to continue to separate parents from their children solely on the basis that a parent had been previously convicted of re-entering the United States on a removal order, which is technically a felony. But it's not a violent felony. It doesn't mean that somebody's not a good parent. As much as the administration likes to push narratives of fake families and things like that, those have always been outliers. The vast majority of parents who are separated from their children had no criminal record, no criminal history, and were just trying to seek a better life for themselves and their children. Question. If someone else assumed the presidency in January 2021, and had a different vision of immigration in this country, are you relatively optimistic that they could reverse a bunch of these things pretty quickly? Answer. Quite a lot of the administration programs could be reversed on day one. The travel ban could be rescinded on day one. MPP, the Remain in Mexico program, could be rescinded on day one. You could stop sending Salvadorans and Hondurans to Guatemala under the so-called asylum cooperative agreements on day one. All of those things could be accomplished immediately. The real measure, however, will be what happens when more asylum seekers realize that the United States has opened its arms again and start coming to the border. Whoever the next president is will have to decide what it means to be a country that opens its arms to those seeking protection and whether we continue to look at families arriving at the border as a threat, as something that needs to be stopped at all costs, or as an opportunity for America to live up to the ideals that we often put out into the world. Question. Is there any chance that judges could issue nationwide injunctions against Democrats trying to reverse something like the travel ban? Answer. I never rule anything out, but the travel ban authority is so broad there's really no legal question that a new president could essentially get rid of it. But you know, what will also be worth noting is how much the current frustration among some members of the Supreme Court about nationwide injunctions holds up when another president is in power. Justices Gorsuch and Thomas recently released a concurring opinion taking issue with their use. I always go back to the fact that U.S. versus Texas, the case that blocked the Obama administration from expanding DACA, was a nationwide injunction, and no one at the time even thought. To mention it. Question. The candidates for president have talked about comprehensive immigration reform. They've talked about the stain that Trump has brought on the presidency and the country because of his many immigration policies. But is there some other things that you think that they should be talking about in terms of our immigration policy? Answer. 
I think that what the Trump administration has shown is that immigration law has so many places where a bad actor can come in and do harm. Whoever the next president is will have to deal with the fact that Trump isn't, wasn't doing what he did through Congress. He wasn't doing what he did through popular support necessarily. It's these incredibly broad grants of authority to the president that allowed him to do this. The time has long passed for our immigration laws to become less punitive and less harsh and to recognize that there needs to be an element of justice in the system that allows people to remain in the United States in situations where they should be able to and for people to come to the U.S. and seek the protection that we've promised without having the barrier of a president who wants to weaponize these obscure provisions of law that were never intended to do that. So, yeah, I don't know if there's much to say about that beyond what it says itself, um, but yeah, it's it's clear to those of us who who keep track of this sort of thing, who follow these uh, things on a regular basis, that the current administration has been pushing in pretty much every direction against constraints. Um, it's not just immigration; it's everywhere. But Trump is basically saying. In effect, I will do what I want to do, and no one is going to stop me if I can help it. And so when, for example, uh, the House changed hands and they started trying to investigate some things, Trump simply said, no, not going to cooperate, not going to talk to you, not going to do anything. Uh, try and make me. And so they tried in various ways up to and including uh, impeaching him and because uh, Republicans were going along with it because they uh, they see more advantage in letting Trump do what he wants than in, in stopping him in any way. Um, they're basically just giving him get out of jail free card and he's using it all over the place and up until the election another few months I guess the only people that can stop him at this point are Republicans because the Democrats are pretty much entirely united in saying no you can't shouldn't be doing all these things Republicans are pretty much remain united in saying yeah, do whatever you want. We don't care because we're getting judges or we're getting this or we're getting that. And and uh, so have at it. Do what you want. Uh, the consequences of this are difficult to imagine. There are... We are not headed in a good direction at all. And I don't see how we get out of this until or unless some... significant portion of the of the population says no more we're fed up with this and right now it's not significant enough uh, the majority of Americans who vote are absolutely against all these things that have been going on and and intend to put a stop to it but there are enough people that are for it that it really will take some segment of the very large portion that just doesn't seem to care or doesn't care enough to do anything uh, to make the difference. And I don't know what that's going to take. I'm hoping that they've been sort of watching passively or <laughs> uh, I don't know what, how you would describe it, but they've been watching and they're thinking, okay, this next election I'm going to vote because I'm not pleased with the direction the country's going. But I don't know because there is so much misinformation out there and there are so many people pushing, pushing uh, that misinformation and actively trying to confuse the issue, not just Russians, but, uh, you know, Americans, news 
companies called Fox TV, uh, uh, Clear Channel, uh, you know, talk radio. There's a, a lot of people who have banded together to say, we want conservatives or right wing persons to be in power and stay in power no matter what the majority or the rest of the people in the country think. Even if a majority of them want to make a change, we want to stay in power enough that we're going to try to use every possible tool that we have to uh, keep that change from happening. And uh, so far it's working. And it will continue to work unless we, you and I, and a lot of other people do something about it. So I strongly suggest that you do something about it. Okay, uh, next article. <clears throat> We're going to jump across the ocean here. Um, this is entitled, Italian Man, 95, res resident in UK for 68 years is told to prove it. I don't think it's fair. 95-year-old Italian man in UK asked to prove residency video. <laughs> okay, so I did not uh, delete that. I, I Anyway, I'm not even going to bother to explain it. It's sometimes things sneak in here that uh, when I'm copying these um, and... I read them as if they're part of the story. So that's a caption to a video that uh, we don't, we're not going to see here. Oh, so I will begin again. A 95-year-old Italian man who's been in the UK for 68 years has been asked to prove he is resident in the country by the Home Office in order to remain after Brexit, despite receiving the state pension for the past 32 years. Antonio Finelli came to the country in 1952 when he answered an appeal for immigrant labor as part of the reconstruction effort after the Second World War ended. That's a long time ago. <laughs> he, welcomed, he was welcomed with one week's advance wages and a sandwich when he arrived at Folkestone Harbor, but almost 70 years later says he has been forced to supply 80 pages of bank statements to prove his right to stay in the U.K., he was asked for proof that he had been in the country for five consecutive years when he applied for the EU settlement scheme, but the Home Office app said it could not find any record of him. It is wrong, he said, as he waited for volunteers' help at an advice center in Islington, North London. His wife and only son have died, and he is also worried about his grandchildren. Will they be okay? he asked the volunteer. It was a surprise because I've had the alien certificate, he said, referring to the document given to immigrants who came to the country between 1918 and 1957. I've been receiving the pension and working all my life, so I don't understand why I have to provide these bank statements, he said. Finelli's case highlights concerns over stress and anxiety being caused to elderly and vulnerable people, many of whom do not understand why they are being asked for paperwork at this stage of their lives. Dimitri Scarlato, a volunteer at Inca CGIL, an advice center for Italian citizens, said he has had one woman in the center who was so stressed about having to find, a, find paperwork that she thought she was going to have a heart attack. What I find unacceptable is that Mr. Finelli has been living here for 70 years. He has been here all his life. He worked for 40 years and after 32 years received his pension. He is a good fellow, a good citizen, and came before freedom of movement, but still has the burden of proving proof of residence. He has been here all these years, but the system treats him as if he doesn't exist. Why? said Scarlato. Finelli, in the second case in a week of elderly EU citizens struggling with the settled status application, which all EU and EEA citizens need to complete in order to stay in the UK after June next year. Last week it emerged that a 101-year-old Giovanni Palmiero, who co coincidentally knew Finelli as a child in Italy, had been told to get his parents to apply on his behalf because the home office system thought he was a one-year-old. 
Scarlato fears that the problem may be much bigger and affects tens of thousands of pensioners if DWP records are not all digitized. We think this is because the DWP records are not digitized. This is a really poorly written story. I apologize. It keeps repeating itself. We have tried to raise this with the Home Office because we are seeing many elderly people come in with, whose records cannot be found, said Scarlato. He said he has more than 100 applications where records cannot be found. Cannot be found. Cannot be found. Gosh, I'm sorry about this. I should have read this more carefully because this is really badly written. I've processed around 500 applications, and half of them are for elderly people. Half these people have not been found by the system, and it asks them to prove their residency, even though the w DWP has been sending out pensions and have been here since the 1950s and 60s. Imagine an elderly person who doesn't have his name on any bill and has no proof of residence that they have been here all these years, and they get to their 80s and 90s and are asked to prove that they have been here for five years. Mr. Finelli will be fine because he has come to the center, but what if you are living alone and vulnerable or in the middle of nowhere and don't know where to go, said Scarlato. Alberto Costa, a Tory MP and longtime champion of EU citizens, said he had in the past repeatedly raised with ministers the expected problem with digital records for vulnerable and elderly people who may need to prove their residence, even though they have been here for 50 to 60 years. The Home Office said applicants, HMRC, and DWP records were automatically matched when EU citizens applied for settled status when it launched the computer and phone app last March. The Guardian asked the Home Office if there was a digitiz digitization, digitization, <laughs> sorry, digitization problem with pension records, but it declined to answer the specific question. Oh, yeah. Automated checks mean that the vast majority of applicants don't have to provide additional evidence, but when it's needed, there is a vast range of evidence people can submit, including doctor's notes, pay slips, and letters from charities, it said. It said the system checks HMRC and DWP records to see if it can confirm how long someone has been in the UK, and in testing, 75% of applications did not need to provide evidence of residence. It did not if specify what <laughs> it did not if specify <laughs> that's what it says it did not if specify that 25 percent of applicants were working age with contemporary hmrc records or pensioners who could only rely on dwp records the home office confirmed to scarlato that they had been successfully processed finelli's application on monday after he, he uploaded 80 pages of bank statements Blah. okay Poorly written story, but you get the point. It, it's like, sometimes it's not even malice. Sometimes it's just a uh, lack of concern and lack of taking care of things. Um, so let's move on. Trust and consequences. The government required him to see a therapist. He thought his words would be confidential. Now, the traumatized migrant may be deported. We're back in the U.S. again here. Surprise, surprise. It was time for another hearing in the ongoing efforts of the U.S. government to deport a Honduran teenager named Kevin Ukeda, who had already been in detention for more than two years. In a Northern Virginia courtroom, U.S. immigration judge Helene Perlman peered at a TV screen as a detainee came into blurry view. A slight 19-year-old with deep dimples and a V-shaped scar on his forehead. Buenos dias, Kevin said, hoping that this was the day he would find out about his request for asylum and then tried to follow along as Perlman began to explain the latest twist. I had made a decision granting your request, but the government disagreed with it, she said. They want me to make a new decision. Kevin was watching from a remote detention center. On one side of the judge, he could see his lawyers ready to argue that he should be freed immediately. Across from them was a lawyer for Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, there to argue that Kevin should be deported. And in front of them all, inside a thick folder, was an old report from a shelter for immigrant children that was the reason the long-running matter of Kevin Yuketa existed at all. Youth reports history of physical abuse, neglect, and gang affiliation in country of origin. 
Unaccompanied child self-disclosed selling drugs. Unaccompanied child reports being part of witnesses with witnessing, sorry, torturing and killing, including dismemberment of body parts, the report said. The person who had signed it, a therapist at a government shelter for immigrant children who had assured Kevin that their session, sessions would be confidential. Instead, the words Kevin spoke had traveled from the shelter to one federal agency and then another, followed him through three detention centers, been cited in multiple ICE filings arguing for his detention and deportation, and now, in the fall of 2019, were about to be used against him once more. This kind of information sharing was part of a Trump administration strategy that is technically legal, but which professional therapy associations say is a profound violation of patient confidentiality. To bolster its policy of stepped-up enforcement, the administration is requiring that notes taken during mandatory therapy sessions with immigrant children be passed onto ICE, which can then use those reports against minors in court. Intimate confessions, early traumas, half remender nightmares, all have been turned into prosecutorial weapons, often without the consent of the therapists involved and always without the consent of the minors themselves in hearings where the stake can be life and death. One of Kevin's lawyers leaned into her microphone and asked Perlman to make a ruling as soon as possible. Kevin has been in detention for 856 days today, she said. The ICE attorney said the government would continue to assert that Kevin was a danger to the country and would rely on its latest legal filing, including references to that first therapist's report. As the lawyers argued back and forth in English, Kevin watched in silence. He only understood a few words here and there, but after two years he knew enough to understand that he was at the mercy of a stranger's interpretations of things he had said when he'd been younger, frightened, and so naive he might as well have been a different person. Finally, the judge turned to him again and asked the interpreter to translate. I'm going to take a very short amount of time to look at the documents, and then I'm going to issue a decision, she said. I'll work as quickly as possible. I know you've been waiting a long time. Each of the 856 days Kevin has been in det detention traced back to an evening in May 2017 when he walked into a small, cheery room in a repurposed nursing home to talk with a woman who introduced herself as a therapist and offered her help. Kevin had crossed the Rio Grande with his 18-year-old sister on an inflatable raft the day before, gotten lost in the Texas scrub, and been found by the U.S. Border Patrol. Agents had sent his sister to an ICE detention center to be jailed until she could be deported, but Kevin was 17, a minor, and so he was transferred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement, the ORR, a federal agency responsible for the custody of each of the tens of thousands of immigrant children who come to the United States alone or are separated from their families at the border every year. ORR was charged with watching over Kevin's health and well-being until he could be released to live in the United States while his request for asylum was being processed. The agency placed Kevin at one of its 195 contracted shelters, a one-story building called New Hope in McAllen, Texas. There, as required by ORR policy, Kevin was offered a chance to shower and brush his teeth, taken to a closet to pick out clothes, and given a medical checkup. With each step, shelter staff entered information about him into a database. One of them noted the scar on Kevin's forehead and wrote that he was feeling really good, despite what a doctor logged as a cough and a sore throat he'd picked up during the three-month journey from Honduras. Next up was a required meeting with a therapist. On his own, since he was 12, Kevin had gotten used to watching adults to see if they were going to hurt him. Mostly they had, but Kevin remembered the New Hope workers seemed friendly and sincere. He was comforted by the smell of spiced cider in the building's halls and the children's drawings taped up everywhere. And so, even though he had only a vague idea of what a therapist did, he was ready to talk to a counselor named Lorraine Trevino, who explained that their conversation would remain private unless he talked about harm to himself or others. This is your opportunity to tell us your story, she said. And so he told her about being abandoned by his parents and raised by his alcoholic grandmother. 
He described how his grandmother had sliced into his back with a machete and once thrown a rock at his head, leaving him with his scar. Youth reports the physical abuse stopped when his grandmother passed away due to drinking, Trevino later wrote in her report. Kevin explained that after his grandmother died, the gang MS-13 took over their shack. With nowhere else to go, he stayed even as gang members tortured rivals on the patio, slept in his bed, and made him run their errands. The gang eventually put him to work selling drugs. Youth denied committing murder, however, when asked if he had ever physically hurt another individual. Miner stated, I did things I regret, Trevino wrote. What Kevin regretted most, he would later testify in asylum proceedings, was what had happened to his cousin Ramon. Ramon had refused to join MS-13. Kevin would testify, and the gang had kidnapped him in retaliation. Kevin asked the gang leader to, to spare his cousin, but instead they ordered him to come to a shack by the river and join in the torture. Ramon was already in a heap on the floor when Kevin arrived and had begged for his help. Please, Kevin remembered him saying, you are my flesh and blood. Terrified to disobey gang orders, Kevin had walked up and kicked his cousin once in the chest, then backed away as the others moved in. When night fell, Kevin snuck out of the shack and hurried towards the dark river bank. He heard shots behind him and knew his cousin was dead. A few weeks later, gang leaders ordered Kevin to kill a stranger to prove his loyalty. Miner was told by gang members that he was required to kill someone he did not know, which prompted Miner to convince his sister to run away with him to the U.S., Trevino wrote. A stream of threatening text messages from the gang followed the siblings north. Miner disclosed that he fears being deported because abandoning his gang results in death, Trevino wrote. Trevino at that point had been on the job for six months. She had graduated from this the year before with a master's in rehabilitation counseling after studying law enforcement in college and was still a year away from passing her licensing exam. An internal audit has found that ORR therapists often feel unprepared to deal with the trauma they encounter in immigration children, in immigrant children. But Kevin felt relieved after talking with her. He walked out of the session feeling lighter for having shared some of his most shameful secrets while Trevino finished her three-page report with an account of how she'd counseled him. Clinician used client-centered approach, provided active listening, empathy, and clarification, she wrote. Youth states feeling safe and secure. Then, because Kevin had mentioned gang activity, Trevino followed policy and sent her report to the shelter director and four regional ORR supervisors. A few days later, Kevin was met with a second therapist who added several details to Trevino's report, including that unaccompanied child states that his involvement in the gang included physically assaulting victims. The following week, the therapist asked to see Kevin again. Kevin thought maybe he was going to get to call his sister, who he hadn't spoken with since they were separated at the border. Instead, the therapist explained that because of what he had said, ORR had decided Kevin should be transferred rather than released. Kevin's response was recorded in his file. Unaccompanied child states, Why are you going to send me to another center? I haven't done anything wrong while I've been here. The next day, Kevin was sent from New Hope, where the average stay was 53 days, to a high-security detention center designed to hold immigrant children for months or years. Well, there's a lot more to this, but I have run out of time. So I'm going to have to leave it at that. Uh, you have been listening to CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana, 104.5 FM and UPTV. And I hope that you can join us again next time. And until then, we'll see you later. Bye-bye.